everyone, I'm Kim Bremer, your host today for another edition of Bova News, keeping you up to date on the cattle industry's latest in technology, management, genetics, and more. The discussion of what type of beef cattle to raise continues to be one we have a lot of interest in, especially after a focus on feedlots report by the University of Kansas was published back in May. According to the April closeout data in this report collected from six large Kansas feed yards, the information showed the cost of gain was 1447 per hundredweight higher for heifers than steers, and the death loss was 0.52% higher in heifers than steers. These are significant numbers when it comes to the feed yard's bottom line. And to get a first-hand opinion on this decision we have is Dr. Justin Gleghorn, the Director of Cattle Risk Management and Customer Service for Cactus Feeders, Inc., with us today to discuss the performance of steers versus heifers within his own program. Justin is responsible for their cattle break-even projection system and fat cattle sales, which represents a one-time capacity of more than 500,000 head. His activities focus on collaboration efforts with 10 feed yard general managers to evaluate endpoint management to optimize feeding margins and carcass merit. And prior to his current role, he was director of livestock hedging, handling risk management for both the beef and pork divisions for cactus feeders. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, Kim, for the opportunity to be here today. We're going to talk about uh, feedlot performance that we've seen in, uh, in closeouts uh, for cattle derived from dairy origins uh, within a steer and heifer population and go through uh, just uh, a broad overview of the performance differences that we see in steers and heifers, and then also touch on breed differences that we've noticed, uh, whether or not those calves were derived from a Jersey cow or a Holstein cow, as there are noticeable differences between, between those genotypes that a, a buyer and a feeder has to be aware of uh, when he's thinking about putting these types of cattle on feed. To start with, we're going to look at uh, some some broad data, looking at closeout summaries for steers and heifers uh, within our database. We have some uh, informational statistics at the beginning at, or at the top of the uh, table that's shown on screen now. Uh, we're looking at about 1,100 lots of heifers and about 1,700 lots of steers, uh, representing 175,000 or 284,000 head of heifers and steers, respectively. You can see that both of these uh, types of cattle come in weighing just a tick over 400 pounds. 421 pound average end weight for a heifer, 459 pound average end weight for a steer. And then final weights uh, for the heifers, we're looking at a, a weight of 1,279 pounds versus a steer weight of 1,338 pounds. Our days on feed are just a tick under 300 days on feed for both steers and heifers, with the heifers being 297 head days on feed and 279 for the steers, with average daily gains of about three pounds for the steer population and 2.75 pounds uh, uh, per head per day for the heifers. When we look at dry matter conversion, both of the animals are, are consuming about 18 pounds of dry matter intake per day, with the heifers being a tick lower at 17.7 .7 pounds and the conversions on both steers and heifers up uh, above six pounds on a dry basis for every pound of gain, with heifers converting at a 6.5 uh, pounds of dry feed to every pound of gain and steers being at 6.1. When we look at health statistics on these animals, uh, we're gonna spend about $10 per head uh, in therapeutic antibiotics or treatment antibiotics for both the steers and the heifers with the steers having a slight advantage. And then our processing dollars, those are the dollars that are basically encompass uh, ear tags, vaccines, uh, implants, deworming, those kinds of things. Both of the uh, populations, uh, right around $20 per head, again, with steers being slightly lower at $18.94 uh, per head for those processing charges. And then finally, the mortality numbers. Uh, in our database, the heifers actually have a lower mortality than their steer counterparts by almost a point. Uh, they're about 80 hundredths of a point better at 4.63% death loss, whereas those steers experience a 5.43%. Uh, percent death loss. So we do see a higher proportion of mortality in our steer population as compared to heifers. So that gives us just a general overview of the, the descriptive statistics uh, between our steer and heifer population when we look at these cattle that were derived from a dairy origin. I think it's important to look at uh, what type of cow produced the calf that we have on feed. And so I'll show some information on those populations of cattle where we can derive uh, which type of cow uh, originated these calves. And if we look at those that have a Jersey influence, the population gets uh, a little bit smaller uh, in our total database numbers, but we do have quite a few lots that we can sort out and make some, some comparisons that are important to us. We're looking at about 5,000 head of steers and heifers, both that came out of a Jersey cow. 
You can see that they came in weighing about 445 to 469 pounds, but noticeably uh, different we'll, we'll, compared to the overall population. You see that the final weight on those heifers is only 1,173 pounds, and the final weight on the steer is 1,365. Days on feed, uh, 304 days on feed for that heifer, whereas the steer is well over 300 days at 342 days. So it just takes a lot of time to get the sellable weight that we need to cover our cost on both these steers and heifers, especially you'll notice when we compare to the Holstein population in just a moment. Uh, average daily gains on those Jersey influenced cattle, the heifers is 2.3 pounds per head per day, whereas the steers are about 2.6. Uh, feed conversions for the heifer, 16.4 pounds for every pound of gain, or excuse me, 16.4 pounds of dry matter intake uh, per head per day, whereas those steers are at 17.8 pounds. And then the feed conversions, the ratio of dry matter feed to every pound of gain is about seven pounds for both the steer and heifer population coming out of a Jersey cow. Medical or uh, the medical dollars, or again, those are the, the dollars that we spend on therapeutic treatments uh, for respiratory disease and those kinds of things are about 13 to 14 dollars a head. Our processing dollars, uh, over $20 a head for both the steer and heifer population. But from a mortality standpoint, uh, relatively low death loss in those heifers coming out of a Jersey cow, 3.5%, and the steers at 5.44%. Um, if we compare that to the the cattle that are out of a Holstein cow, we can see a dramatic difference uh, in the in the feedlot performance. You'll notice that the database is quite larger for those Holstein influenced animals versus Jerseys, but regardless, uh, you can see that the cattle perform much differently and are much more efficient in the utilization of feed to gain uh, than their Jersey counterparts. These Holstein influenced cattle have larger outweights. The heifers are at 1,282 pounds. Again, their Jersey counterparts were only 1,173 pounds. On the steer side, those Holstein uh, origin steers have 1,338 pound average outweight, whereas we did get the uh, jerseys to 1,365, but it took more days to get there. Average daily gain is quite uh, markedly different. Average daily gain for a heifer is 2.76, uh, about three tenths, uh, four tenths of a pound higher than the Jersey counterpart. And uh, the steers also about four tenths of a pound heavier or higher on average daily gain for that Holstein steer uh, influence steer versus the Jersey at 3.0 pounds, 3.0 pounds per head per day. Uh, the Holstein's uh, influence cattle do eat more per day at about 18 pounds on a dry basis and feed conversions are 6.5 uh, for the heifer and 6.0 for the steer. Uh, the expenses for medical treatment or for antibiotic treatment uh, are lower than they were for their Jersey counterparts. Processing dollars were about the same and the mortality rates, uh, less than 5% death loss on the heifers, and a tick over 5% for the steer population at 5.43. Overall, when we try to put all this into a number uh, to quantify what is the value difference between a steer versus a heifer, on a Holstein population, that heifer is going to have about $120 per head discount to the steer counterpart due to lower average daily gain, more days to get to a final outweight. When you look at that difference in the steer and a heifer population on the jerseys, that $120 per head difference increases up to about $190 per head. So again, a heifer that comes out of a Jersey cow has a discount applied to her of about $190 a head because of the feeding performance that she does not bring to the table relatively low average daily gain, uh, conversions that are relatively poor, just the inability to generate a big outweight. So that is something that a feeder definitely has to keep in mind that the heifers do have uh, a discount factor that needs to be applied when you're pricing those cattle. And again, in our system, we calculate that to be $120 per head when we're talking about something out of a Holstein cow and up to $190 per head different when we're talking about something out of a Jersey cow. One thing that we have to take into account are the uh, improvements in genetics and growth rate in these cattle over time. And so what we're, we're looking at on, on this chart is a change in outweight for the entire population uh, going back to those cattle that were, were slaughtered in calendar year 2020, which is the blue bar, calendar year 2021, which is a red bar, or what we've uh, harvested so far through 2022, which is a green bar. As you can see for both steers and heifers, with the influence of improved genetics, 
we've been able to increase the outweight of both steers and heifers by about 150 pounds. And we haven't necessarily done that at the expense of additional days on feed. I truly believe that that is just an influence of the growth rates that uh, are being uh, seen by using superior genetics on these cattle. And that's one advantage that these cattle do have is uh, the ability to go handpick sires and use those sires on large populations of cattle because basically all these calves are produced through an artificial insemination program. And so a, uh, a dairy can be very, very selective on using the uh, upper tier sires. And this is the result that we see by as we keep putting uh, selection pressure on growth and feeding performance uh, through the sire selection are these 150 pound uh, improvements in finish weight in relatively short periods of time. When we look at the same comparison across year for both the steers and heifers, looking at average daily gain, uh, you can see that we've improved average daily gain rates in both the steers and heifers across those three years that we're looking at. Heifers on average are up about 15 hundredths of a pound uh, over the three year period or about 6%, whereas steers are up about 45 hundredths of a pound or 16% over that same three year period. And at today's ration prices, where we're looking at dry matter ration prices uh, in and around $350 on a per ton basis, that improvement in that steer average daily gain in that very short period of time is worth about $45 per head. So again, the ability to improve the genetics and focus on growth and efficiency uh, bears a lot of weight in today's environment where we have very high ration prices. We look at the same feed conversion comparison over time. You can see that we really haven't uh, changed much in terms of feed conversion on the heifers over that three-year period. Basically, uh, they're they're going to have a feed conversion on a dry basis of about 6.45 to 6.6 .6 pounds for every pound of gain. Uh, whereas the steers, we have improved or actually increased uh, the feed conversion rate going back to 2020 uh, compared to the 2022 comparison. The feed conversions haven't gotten numerically higher, but uh, that's not necessarily uh, causing us uh, a decrease in margin or profitability in the cattle because, again, we've increased the outweight and the rate of daily gain in these cattle so much that it, it offsets those additional cost in feed or that numerically higher feed conversion that we see in the steers. Talk a little bit about carcass metrics, uh, just a brief overview of the uh, the car carcass characteristics of these cattle, you can see on average, heifers have an average carcass weight of 826 pounds, whereas the steers are 100 pounds heavier at 926. On average, the heifers return back a premium over a base formula of about $49 per head, whereas the steers are $10 below that at $39 a head. The majority, if not all of those premiums, in most cases are derived through quality grade, uh, where the cattle are reaping benefits uh, based on uh, the percentage choice or higher. So you can see that on average, the heifers grade about 13% prime, whereas the steers grade 5% prime. The cattle that do qualify for CAB, and again, CAB uh, in, in their guidelines, uh, they talk about superior muscling. These cattle do qualify uh, for that CAB designation because uh, they ha do have superior muscling. You can see that about 39% of the heifers qualify for the CAB stamp, whereas 28% of the steers qualify for that CAB designation. And then on just raw percent choice, 35% uh, of the heifers are choice, uh, whereas a higher proportion of the steers at 46% are choice. Um, the difference between steers and heifers on choice is frankly the fact that more of the heifers fall into the upper two thirds or that CAB designation or fall into the prime. So you have fewer cattle that actually qualify for base or low choice designation. Overall, heifers are about 87% choice or better and the steers are about 79% choice or better. So these cattle do carry carcass metrics or car have the carcass characteristics that we're looking for to produce a high quality carcass that can carry uh, those quality grade premiums that we're looking for within the cattle population. Looking at the cutability, uh, about seven to eight percent of both steers and heifers uh, have a numerical yield grade one. Uh, almost 40% of them uh, are stamped with the yield grade two. Uh, yield grade fours and fives tend to run about 16 to 12% for the heifers and steers respectively. So these cattle aren't necessarily overly fat. Uh, when we look at the amount of back fat uh, relative to rear by area and carcass weight, 
uh, and then when we compound that with the fact that the quality grade that they're bringing, they're they're fairly efficient uh, in terms of producing a carcass that can generate some carcass premiums. But there are differences in the steers and the heifers where the heifers tend to grade a little bit better uh, when we look at the upper two thirds and prime designation uh, as compared to steers. I'm going to finish up with just a couple of slides to show you some trends over time because I think it's important. Again, we saw this in growth rates where uh, intensive sire selection allows us to make uh, uh, improvements in, in these metrics over time. And we're seeing this in the quality grade trends as well. What we're looking at here are uh, two charts. The top chart breaks out uh, carcass premiums or discounts in three large buckets. The green line represents those premiums or discounts related to quality grade only. The red line indicates premiums or discounts related to cutability. You'll grade ones, twos, or fours and fives, those types of premiums or discounts. And then finally, the blue line represents any premiums or discounts related to carcass weight, carcasses that are too large or carcasses that are too small. So that's what the top chart shows us. All right, if we're generating carcass premiums, where do the premiums come from? It's pretty easy to tell that the green line or the quality grade premiums are driving the bus going all the way back to 2020. You can see that we've steadily increased the premiums related to quality grade over time, where right now it's not uncommon for uh, these cattle to generate a quality grade premium of $60 to $80 per head. And then when you look at cutability premiums or weight uh, premiums or discounts, they tend to hover around zero. So not a lot of premium or discounts are being captured relative to quality or excuse me, cutability or carcass weight. It's largely being driven by quality grade. And so the bottom chart, the brown line, basically just puts those three lines together and says overall, what kind of uh, carcass premiums are we putting together? And because that line does have a positive slope, we are increasing quality grade or uh, uh, carcass premiums over time. And it is a result of quality grade being the main driver. The last slide I want to look at is just a quick look at the heifer population specifically. So we're looking at the same data in the same format, but now we're looking at all the heifers and I've excluded the steers. And what I want to drive home here is although the heifers, they have a discount, again, on a Holstein uh, origin type of animal, it's about $120 per head, or on a Jersey, it's $190 a head discount. These heifers are generating uh, quality grade premiums or overall carcass premiums at a faster rate than the steers. And so in today's environment with the, the spreads, the way they are between choice and select and the prime and, and the CAB premiums, those heifers are returning a premium of about $100 a head. When we combine in the weight and the cutability, in addition to that, it's about a $90 average uh, over the last couple of months uh, on these uh, on these heifers that we've marketed. So with that, uh, that's the end of the data that I have to show. But the bottom line, there is a difference between the steers and the heifers and the cattle feeder has to be aware uh, of what discounts to apply to those cattle. In our database, it would appear that uh, a Holstein origin heifer has about $120 per head discount and a Jersey origin heifer would have about $190 uh, per head discount. And certainly the cattle feeding cattle feeder needs to be aware of that when he buys those animals and gets ready to put them on feed because he, he needs to knows, know that there is a difference between those animals. So with that, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to visit about our population and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Justin. So a few questions for you today. Uh, what would you say are the biggest challenges facing, facing beef raisers today? Uh, the biggest challenge raising uh, facing cattle or, you know, somebody feeding cattle to produce beef. Yes. Yep. So uh, the biggest challenge here in the near term are uh, just uh, volatility in markets. Uh, we're seeing increases in prices. Uh, the costs of productions uh, are increasing, it seems, with, with every passing week. And uh, some uncertainty out there in the overall macroeconomic uh, uh, environment. Uh, Obviously, beef demand, especially domestic demand, is critical to maintaining the prices that we're receiving for, for, for cattle in addition to what uh, we're able to sell the, the final product uh, in the retail case for. So uh, on the input side, increasing cost, overall inflationary risks are, are on our mind. 
and then at the same time maintaining beef demand and being able to deliver to our consumers a product that they're still willing to pay for uh, as prices increase are the main factors that I think are important to a, a cattle producer in today's environment. And what advice would you have for people to overcome some uh, advice, of those? I'm sorry? To overcome some of those. Uh, advice to overcome some of those uh, uh, challenges. Obviously, sound risk management programs are, are necessary. Um, it's pretty easy to look at the cattle market and think that we're, we have the opportunity to be in a strong bull uh, type of a market over the next couple of years. And uh, given supply side uh, factors, that's, that's probably the case. But all of that depends on demand. We have to maintain demand, if not build demand, in order to keep these prices uh, going higher. But just because the prices for the product we're selling are going higher doesn't mean that our input costs are staying the same or even, even getting cheaper. So I think a producer has to be aware of not only the price risk for the product that he's selling, but he also has to be aware of the price risk for his inputs. And I think they have to be on top of those to manage both of them effectively because of volatility and just the overall opportunity for price risks, either up or down to eat away into your margin or too, too large. And uh, that's where a sound risk management program on both the input side and the finished product side are absolutely necessary. What do you think are some of the keys to a successful beef calf raising program? What are the top ones? I think the, the keys to a successful program, uh, we have to keep in mind on, on what we're producing and who we're producing it for. What we have to listen to our, our customer, uh, what type of product are they after? I think over the last couple of years, it's, it's very evident uh, that they like the product that we're producing. They like the quality grade. They like the uh, palatability and the eating experience that they're purchasing when they when they go to the store and bring our product home. And so we have to keep that in mind because that's at the end of the day, that's who we're, we're relying on to keep our product moving at a price that we can try to uh, achieve some margin and stay in business from year to year. So we have to keep listening to our consumer uh, and what they want and listen to them and be able to provide them the product that they that they demand. Now, when buying calves in large groups, what traits do you select for consistently? Oh, uh, you know, when we're we're looking for cattle uh, in in large groups, obviously, uh, some information about the uh, genetics, the background of the cattle, uh, what type of sires, what type of cows, because that gives us an idea of what kind of feeding performance we can expect and what kind of carcass uh, we can expect out of the animals. And so, it all comes down to being able to to price them correctly in the marketplace. Uh, one of the biggest risks to, to cactus feeders is overpaying for cattle that can't meet our expectations. Again, we we don't exist in an environment where our margins are grossly uh, large. So we're in a small, tight margin production model and there's not much room for error. So when we go purchase an animal, it's, it's very, very important that those animals meet our expectations on how we price the, uh, the, the, feeder, the feeder animal. So any information that we have that can help us better project those cattle, that's a premium to us. Uh, that's a value to us. And those are some of the things that we search for in the marketplace. Not all the animals have to be, you know, the, the highest average daily gain or the lowest feed conversion. But as long as we can accurately project them and we know what to expect out of them, those cattle have value. It's all about correctly assigning value to the cattle. Now, beef on dairy has become this increasing trend in the industry. What do you see as the benefits of this trend? Uh, the beef on dairy, uh, they have a positive impact, I believe, on the, on the beef supply chain because uh, the dairies in that industry, they're our neighbors. Uh, you know, we compete with them for for inputs, whether it be labor, whether it be water, uh, whether it be forage, access to those different inputs. They're our neighbors and we have to be able to work with them. Um, they do provide an opportunity for us because they supply an animal uh, that's different than the supply chain on coming out of the beef cow herd. Um, basically the animals coming out of a dairy, they're born every day, they're born every week and so it's a fairly consistent supply chain of cattle that we can take advantage of, especially as a cattle feeder. You know, the oscillations uh, 
in, in cattle placements is largely dependent upon mother nature. Uh, is there forage to graze these cattle outside or has it been the case in 2022 where we've had widespread drought, you know, we haven't had the opportunity to keep these cattle outside of feed yards. And so they've come to us at a lighter weight, uh, which leads to more days on feed, uh, comes with some health risks that we have to manage and figure out how to manage uh, as best we can. But these cattle coming out of a dairy, uh, they don't necessarily suffer from those same type of uh, effects that mother, mother nature throws on them. Largely, they're, they're gonna be coming to you on a uh, fairly consistent basis every month. And so that is a benefit to the to the beef industry is the supply chain aspects. And then secondly, uh, it's pretty apparent that these these animals can produce a very very nice carcass that our consumer uh, can take advantage of. Again, uh, I think demand is key, and it appears that our consumer likes a palatable product when they go buy it. They want a good eating experience, and obviously. Uh, higher quality grade, higher levels of marbling help improve uh, the odds of a positive eating experience. And these cattle help fill that need and allow us to produce a consistent product week in and week out that, uh, again, fits the demand uh, that our consumers are wanting. And have you seen any differences in the beef crossbred calves that enter your operation? Well, yes, there are differences. Um, you know, we look for uh, supplies of cattle that come from known genetics. Again, where those those dairies, those breeders are making concerted effort to use the upper tier sires on their cows uh, to get the kind of results that, that, that we need. Um, and then obviously there are differences between uh, genotypes uh, of the type of cow that produce that calf. It's very apparent that the jerseys are different than the Holsteins. And so those are the main differences that we've seen, uh, especially the genotype of the cow uh, that produced that calf. Do you think this trend will continue to evolve? I do believe that the uh, the trend for the beef on dairy uh, will continue to involve, uh, evolve and will continue to uh, improve. Uh, I think there's been a lot of effort and capital and time invested over the last couple of years to, to figure out how these cattle perform and what they're worth. and um, I, I think they're here to stay, and I think it's an opportunity for the cattle feeder and for the beef industry uh, to work with the dairy industry and producing a product that can benefit us both. I think th I think they're here to stay. Yes. And what do you see for the future at Cactus Feeders? Uh, just continuing to provide a product that our consumer uh, uh, wants us to produce. Uh, looking for opportunities to. To, to benefit our shareholders, our employees, so that, uh, you know, we can Im improve uh, their standards of living at the individual level while maintaining profitability in the cattle feeding industry while producing a product uh, that continues to, to meet the needs of our consumers so that people continue to eat beef and look for the beef uh, uh, industry to be the center portion of the plate. When they talk about protein and high quality protein, they're coming to us. And we want to be able to fill that need for them so that we're the, we're the primary uh, focus when they think about eating high quality protein. Well said. Thank you, Justin, for joining us today and sharing your invaluable expertise and experience. Don't forget to subscribe to the Bova News channel on YouTube. Find our Bova News podcast on your favorite listening platform or find more information at bovanews.com. Thanks for tuning in with us today and we'll see you next time on another edition of Bova News.